Hi guys, I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And we are here recording Lost in the Woods. So today we are covering the disappearance and murder of Peggy Knobla. All right, if you do hear some noise in this one, we have uh, some work being done in our garage, so there might be some clanking here and there. We do apologize. Now our case today comes from a little town called Lynchenburg in Bulgaria. Germany. We also want to let you know that this case does involve a child, so I know those ones can be a little more difficult for all of us, and we just want to give you a heads up. Also, it takes place in Germany, so our pronunciation might not be perfect. Yes. Try to be nice. So Peggy was born on April 6th, 1992, to 19-year-old mother Suzanne Kolblock. Who, though she hadn't planned on a pregnancy, she was thrilled. So Susanna actually ended up leaving Peggy's father six months after she was born and eventually ended up moving to Lichtenberg with her new boyfriend and having a second child, Yasmin. And this was when Peggy was six that she was born. Lichtenberg is a small town, roughly 1,000 residents as of 2020. So that's pretty small. It sits in northern Bavaria and is located on a hill and in the boundary of Frankenwald Nature Park. Up until 2001, the town and surrounding areas were described by tourists as wildly romantic and with an extensive woodland, vast meadowland, mountains and castles, they would have been right. But this would all change in the spring of 2001. Castles. I love castles. I really want to go. Yeah, I really want to go see a castle. I want to see a castle in real life. On May 7 of 2001, Peggy Knobla, who is just nine years old, would vanish on her way home from school. And her disappearance has become one of the most well-known German missing children's cases. And Peggy is often referred to as the German Madeline McCain. Mm. So, for those of you who don't know, Madame McCain was a three-year-old girl who disappeared from her hotel, or her resort, room while her parents were having dinner, and they've actually had some uh, recent developments, so we might get some answers soon. On that case, anyway. Yeah, but she was sleeping in a room with a couple other kids, and then her parents were having dinner on the resort, and then she's gone. Yeah, it's it's a pretty mysterious one. It's pretty crazy. So Peggy was described as lively, open-minded, and a confident child. She would play outside and interact with other people in town. So she was well-known and well-loved by the people living in Lechenburg. Peggy was a third grader, and while Peggy started out a great student, her attitude and attention changed. She was no longer interested in school and not concentrating, not turning in homework, and often didn't want to go. Even her favorite subject, math. Peggy's grades were getting worse and worse. Right, and she's, what, nine years old. This is third grade, so... How bad can... Well, no, but, like, this could just be normal. Getting older, not loving school as much. I think third grade is where I started to not like school as much. Or it could be an indication that something is wrong. Yeah. The only thing Peggy was still interested in was sports, and she had joined a girls' soccer club just six months before she disappeared and also attended children's gymnastic lessons. But this new hobby didn't seem to be helping Peggy as she grew quiet, withdrawn, and even started wetting herself. Ooh. Now, that to me is a bigger red flag than, like, the school and yeah. also her not being interested in normal things that she's interested in also is a red flag to me. Other kids at school actually reported seeing bruises on her, but there was no evidence that she was being abused or mistreated at home. Still, something in Peggy's world had changed, and it was obvious that it was upsetting her. Her mother grew more and more concerned, 
After Peggy disappeared, the landlord of the pub, which Peggy sometimes went to to do her homework in after school, accused his own son of taking Peggy into the pub's apartment and doing things, which is very vague, but either way does not sound like a good thing. No. And like I feel like I feel like bedwetting is a very obvious like if it's especially like newfounded bedwetting, I feel like that's a huge sign of like sexual abuse. Well, some kind of abuse for sure, yeah. yeah. The landlord's son though did deny all accusations. Naturally as one does. No one really wants to admit <laughs> anything like that. Yeah, no kidding. So on another occasion, Peggy's gymnastics coach, Norbert Rank, reported that he had been approached by Peggy after a lesson and she had said something which he found really inappropriate for a child of nine to say. He said that he couldn't recall the exact wording, but he believed that she was making a reference to a brothel. Yeah. Which, yeah, so that that is a... That is a bit strange. And I mean, kids that kids that are abused do say some really out-of-pocket stuff. So, a youth trainer at the same club also reported that Peggy would often adjust her underwear during lessons in a way which was concerning. Right, and I do not know what that means. Like, I don't know how you adjust your underwear in a concerning way. You are doing a lot of jumping and rolling and things like that so maybe she just did um a large amount of adjusting like she was very uncomfortable yeah maybe I don't know because I mean when you have a class full of kids and I'm sure you watch kids adjust themselves constantly in a gymnastics class like I mean I don't know so what would she be doing that would make it concerning Yeah, yeah I don't know but I mean maybe she was doing something that the gymnastics coach saw that it was concerning compared to the other children or yeah I don't know I'm not sure what it means but either way neither of these incidents were reported until after she went missing because I do feel like those would be besides like saying something to a parent I don't know there there'd be nobody to report that to anyway yeah other worrying incidents which Peggy's mother estimated started around a year before her daughter disappeared were Peggy's behavioral changes so not wanting to be alone, not wanting to play outside. And by the way, her mom's name is Suzanne. I think we might have said Susanna earlier, but it's Suzanne. I definitely said Susanna. (laughs) Yeah. Suzanne also mentions later that the house used to receive calls from an unknown number, and when Peggy would answer, she would seem scared, but would say that it was no one and hang up. When someone else in the family answered one of these calls... There was no voice on the other end of the line, and the caller would immediately hang up. Peggy's stepfather said that the number of calls increased in the last few weeks leading up to her going missing. Hmm. That's very concerning. Yeah. So on the morning of the 7th of May, 2001, Peggy was refusing to go to school, but after a little bit of persuasion from her mother, she relented and was out the door at 7.30 a.m. Peggy then goes to a local shop to buy some food for her lunch and some sweets and makes it to school just in time for her first lesson. Now, the school lets out at 12.50 p.m., and Peggy gets out of school before realizing she forgot her wallet and went back in to look for it. She finds it at 12.55 p.m. under her desk. She then meets up with a friend, Daniela, and the two walk home together stopping at a chewing gum machine, which I'm assuming is just some sort of machine that dispenses candy. Uh, Is this in the street? I mean, we have these sometimes like inside stores or malls, but I've never seen them like just. Yeah, they might have just went to like a. Into like a corner store that had like a gumball machine. Yeah, maybe. They are then seen by a classmate, and then 10 minutes after, the two girls pass by a classmate's house and talk to the sister of their classmate. And this is confirmed by the mother of another classmate who was driving by and recognized Peggy's blonde hair and her pink satchel bag, which she always carried. The two continue into town and parted ways at Henry 
Marte Plaza, the main square in town, with the agreement that they would meet to walk together to school the next day. From the main square, it is about 200 meters to Peggy's apartment. So that's about 656 feet. So not very far. Not very far. And it would be in this 200 meters that Peggy would vanish without a trace. She is last seen officially at 1.24 p.m. turning the corner onto her street. So Peggy's mother arrived home from work around 8.15 p.m. that evening to discover that Peggy was not home. So Susan worked as a geriatric nurse, and she was often at work when Peggy would come home from school. So, like, this is not unusual that Susan is getting home. Right. Although I do feel like 8.15 is kind of late, and I'm wondering what the stepfather half-sibling situation is. Yeah. Why is she home alone? I don't know. I don't know that she is. That's what I'm curious about. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Gotcha. So... Peggy had her own key to the apartment and would let herself in or she would go to the neighbor's house often or even the local pub like we said earlier. And she would do all this until her parents finished work. So stepdad must be working too. So the apartment is dark, Peggy's shoes aren't by the door, and her satchel was gone. It was exactly how she left it before she went to work. So... Peggy has not been home at all, is what she's realizing. Right. Which would be a horrifying situation to walk into. So, instead of panicking, Susan goes to the neighbors to check if instead of going home, Peggy went there instead. When there's no sign of Peggy, Susan starts to call everyone she knows, including Peggy's teacher, to ask if anyone had seen her. But no one knew where she was. At 9.56, Suzanne picked up the phone again and called 110, which is German's 911. And the police respond with a search team immediately. Good. So Daniela, Peggy's friend who walked home from school with her, is woken up and she confirmed that she had last seen Peggy heading towards her house around 1.30. Yeah, and it's almost 10 o'clock now. That's a long time ago. Yeah. So, around 3 a.m., the police start questioning the extended family, including Peggy's biological father. His name is Mario. And he tells police that he has not seen Peggy in years. And given that he lived several hours away, the police decided to rule him out for the time being. Right. Which, first of all, I feel like him being like, I haven't seen Peggy in years, and him being really far away doesn't really doesn't really isn't good yeah. enough in my opinion i think just they didn't want to waste time on that if she was safe with her dad they wanted to make sure that she yeah, wasn't which i do respect yeah. but i'm at least they say for the time being not like right. totally because like she's been missing since one thirty. it's like 3 a.m it's a long time yeah now at three thirty a.m peggy's stepfather started to put up missing posters around town And police asked Suzanne for a photo of Peggy and asked her permission to put out her full name in the media for an appeal for leads. Okay. So a large-scale search operation commenced around 8 a.m. on May 8th, the day after Peggy didn't return home from school. 100 searchers covered the immediate vicinity of the town. And while many have high hopes of finding the girl alive, this all proves fruitless they find nothing yeah the surrounding forest is searched meter by meter and helicopters are deployed to search for any trace of peggy from the air with still no sign of peggy the search area was expanded to cover the bordering thurangia forest areas even with the use of thermal imaging cameras and federal assistance with infrared planes nothing was found in the woods or any bodies of water nearby Now, due to the extensive media coverage, numerous tips are called in and witness statements are taken. It seems as though Peggy had been seen after the official 1.30 p.m. estimation. One witness claimed he saw Peggy getting into a car at 2 p.m. And this claim was backed up by two schoolboys who also reported to have seen Peggy between 2.45 and 3 p.m. 
getting into a car. The boys who were questioned on May 8th were shown pictures of Peggy and confirmed that it was her that they had seen. They described the car as being a Mercedes with a Czech license plate. They were sure that it was a Mercedes because they recognized the badge on the front of the car, and one of the boys had reportedly told his mother about it on the evening that Peggy had vanished. After several interrogations of the boys, both with and without their parents present, their account became a little more detailed, with one even claiming to have seen a pack of gum in Peggy's hand. However, on June 11, 2001, one of the boys retracted his statement, claiming he had made the whole thing up, and the second boy followed shortly after. This is just one example of many suspected false reported sightings of Peggy by children in Lichtenberg. So children just start saying that they saw Peggy that day. Okay. Which is really frustrating. A couple eating at a restaurant reported seeing a girl matching Peggy's description at a restaurant a few kilometers from Lichtenberg. At first, this statement was taken very seriously by police, but later decided that this tip was another false lead. Of course. On May 10 of 2001, a walker reported finding a corpse of a young girl holding a doll on a path in the forest outside of Lichtenberg. He reported it to police when he got home, but when they went to investigate, they could find no trace of the body in the location and they believe he made it up. What is wrong with people? What's wrong with these children? The hunt for Peggy Knobla began stretching further afield, even abroad as leads took investigators to the Czech Republic and to the stepfather's homeland of Turkey. But despite a reward of 55,000 euros and over 4,000 tips, no hard evidence on the whereabouts of Peggy was found. So the investigation did bring up several potential suspects. The first suspect we'll cover is Robert E. He was a resident of Lichtenberg at the time that Peggy went missing. While there were no initial clues, the police received an anonymous tip, which seemed to be enough for them to search Robert's house with a cadaver dog. But nothing ended up being found. So why did he even become a suspect? I'm confused. He actually, part of it was he had a previous history of abusing minors. He had previously abused his 10-year-old goddaughter and 11-year-old step-granddaughter and served three years in prison for these offenses. Jesus. The police spent a week digging around on his property in 2013, and they actually found bones, but these were later attributed to the fact that his house was built over an old cemetery. First of all, that shit's haunted as fuck if you're built over an old cemetery. Yeah. No way you can convince me your house isn't haunted. So, yeah, an anonymous tip mixed with his record got him on police's radar. Now, another suspect was Jens Beaver, and on the 11th of May, he made a statement to police that he might know who was responsible for Peggy's disappearance. Now, he was the neighbor that Peggy would visit after school sometimes, and he had been a big part of her life. I don't like that. He told police that he had four suspects, one being Peggy's mother, though he alleged that she merely staged the disappearance and hadn't killed her child. Jens also accused Peggy's stepfather, her biological father, and a local motorcycle gang for her disappearance. It was this constant insertion of himself into the investigation that ultimately made the police suspicious of Jens. And they began to look into what he was doing when Peggy went missing. Yeah, reasonable. Let's blame the... I I like Jens as the potential. Yeah, well, and according to Jens, he was at home on the computer while his wife was asleep at the time that Peggy vanished. Convenient. But on reviewing his computer activity, the police discovered that he hadn't pressed any keys between 1.18 p.m. and 2.06 p.m. on the 7th of May. And when confronted with this information, Jens changed his story and said that he was making something to eat during that time. So police think that Jens could have possibly become 
angry with Peggy and killed her in a fit of rage, as he had previously stated that she was difficult and annoying. And why is she coming over to your house? Yeah, why is he? Why? If you find her annoying, why? Yeah, so Yin had been under a lot of stress at the time, and he had just lost his driver's license, and as a result was out of work as a courier. According to police, Yin's was so irritable and confused when being questioned that he didn't even rule himself out of being the killer. Yeah, but don't worry. The police did try to have a hypnotist come and help him remember more clearly. Never going to be admissible in court, but that's fine. I think Yins did it. Even years after the disappearance, the case continued to consume Yens, leading to a breakdown of his marriage. And over the course of the investigation, he had made several inappropriate comments such as, Peggy was already a pretty one and had the right proportions. Gross. When asked, Yen's wife did not seem surprised that her husband had made comments like that. Cool. Our next suspect is Holger E. He was actually very closely linked with Yen's beaver. These two are adoptive brothers, so they did it together. Are you kidding me? I already know. I already know. I'm already suspicious. So Holger lived in the nearby town of Halle. He was 17 when Peggy went missing, and he soon became involved in the investigation when a handwritten note with his name and address and number was found in one of Peggy's notebooks. That's weird. Why are you writing letters to a nine-year-old girl? So when police questioned him at his home, Holger was wearing a locket, With a picture of Peggy inside of it. That's not fucking creepy. What the actual fuck? And he claims that he's only been wearing these necklace since Peggy disappeared. But why Hoger? A relative stranger, Peggy's neighbor's adoptive brother, be wearing a picture, a necklace with a picture of a nine-year-old around his neck. Yeah, well, he shouldn't be. That's weird. I'm guessing in, like, a weird, twisted way to try and support or something, but it's really weird. Um, so if that feels gross, it gets worse. So when police searched his room, they found dozens of photos of Peggy. So many that police said it seemed obsessive. I think any amount of pictures of Peggy in his oh my God. residence would be what if it obsessive. Ruined? No, you're right. You're right. Any. Any pictures... Obsessive. Weird. What if Yen's entire life and marriage got destroyed because he's convinced that his brother did it? So it's. I think if I think if the brother did it, I think they both did it. Yeah, you're right. I don't know though. Holger is interviewed, and when the photos are brought up, he stated that he had a very intimate but strictly fraternal relationship with Peggy, and that this was the reason that Peggy would go over to the neighbor's house after school. Holger told police that Peggy had wanted to live with him in Hale and had mentioned that though she loved her stepfather, he would beat Peggy. Holger claimed that he had left Peggy his address and number so that she could contact him if she was ever in trouble with her stepfather. So, some finger pointing. Yeah. I could see the, like, if you're adopted and you meet a little girl, you're 17, you meet a child, and they remind you of younger you, and they're being beat by, they tell you that they're being beat by their stepdad. Maybe. Assuming that that's even true. But, but, he has the massive amount of photos of her, and the locket. Maybe if it was just the locket, and he said that he started wearing it after she went missing, which is weird, But, like, the only way it'd be acceptable if, like, Peggy gave him the locket. And they had, like, a brother-sister relationship. But there's there's too much going on for me to believe that that's the case. I don't buy it at all. So when asked his whereabouts on May 7th, 2001, Holger said that he was at school in the morning and in a homemade wooden clubhouse in the afternoon. He was last in Lichtenberg in 2000. Though later admitted that it was actually in January of 2001. 
when police investigated his alibi, they found that the class register for May 7th was missing. And though could not substantiate the claim of Holger visiting the clubhouse in the woods, invalidated his alibi. So, yeah, the class registry is missing and no one was at the clubhouse with you? Not a good alibi. No. More worryingly, Holger is said to have been in a relationship with an 11-year-old girl who ended things with him in April of 2001. That's very disgusting. Police also discover a disc with child pornography on it alongside with more portrait-style photos of Peggy. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and say that Holger is a disgusting pig, and I cannot even handle this. Like, how did he have... Where did he get all of these pictures of Peggy? He took them himself, I suppose. So why is Peggy this very young girl? Well, obviously, Peggy, I I think that it sounds like to me that Peggy is being groomed by Holger. Holger 17. He's and the, already had, And the brother. And the brother. I think both of them. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I think they both could be involved, but it's definitely this one. Definitely the 17-year-old. He's had I a— mean, You said that about the first guy when we were talking about him. This okay, is the guy. Yes, but <laughs> now this guy definitely has photos. He has— They both had photos in their possession. But he has a lot, it sounds like. This so guy it's gives probably both of them, and if it's not both of them, then the older brother who ruined his life just kept continuously thinking about this case knows his brother did it. Maybe. Or he they both did it together. I'm not sure, but the ne- brother thing, the neighbor, the locket, the photos, it's all weird as shit. I know. Now, all of this evidence and worrying circumstances eventually came to nothing. I literally don't understand how that's nothing. I know. In 2002... I've seen people prosecuted for murder for way fucking less. I know. Tell me about it. Like, now, even if he didn't do it, he might deserve to stay in prison for doing it. Well, let's just lock him up to be safe in this situation. I mean, he, he did said, date an 11-year-old girl. And he has, like, hundreds of photos. You're disgusting. And an obsessive amount of photos of we a 9-year-old like girl. That's weird. Yeah. Now, in 2002... The investigation heads in a new direction, and Holger is dropped as a suspect. Though it is worth mentioning that Holger was convicted of abusing Jens Beaver's daughter and his own daughter shortly after his questioning by police, and he went to prison for several years either way. Okay. He's a daughter? I fucking guess so. I'm guessing that's why they dropped him as a suspect, at least in the meantime, because he was going to jail. They didn't need to worry about him. Yeah. And their investigation had started to go in a new way. Okay, well. uh... Yeah. Now, in 2002, police turned their attention to Yulvi Kulag, a 24-year-old man who lived in Lichtenberg with his parents. Of course he does. Yulvi had... You better watch it. I'm real close to being 24 (laughs) and living with my parents. (laughs) Jeez. I'm a little bit too close to that for you to be like, of course he is. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I take it back. Yulvi had contracted viral meningitis as a small child and had been significantly mentally impaired by this illness. Okay, now I really take it back. He can live with his parents. He had the brain development of roughly an 8 or 10-year-old. Now, unfortunately, Yulvi was well known throughout Lichtenberg for exposing himself to children, but he was generally considered harmless. But when his mother found out that he supposedly inappropriately touched a young boy in 2000, she questioned him about Peggy going missing and reported him to authorities. He was questioned on May 8 of 2001. Oh my God, imagine that. Well, at least she like reported her son and stuff because she was like, Probably has always known that her son's, like, flashing kids and, like, doing all this stuff. And she's just, like, always just kind of thought, like, the rest of the community, oh, he's just, like... Harmless. Harmless. Like, it... And then when she discovered he's not, she started thinking, well, maybe. Well, maybe he did something to Peggy, which um, I would say that is a relatively reasonable jump. Mm -hmm. Yulvi's alibi was pretty solid. He went with his parents to a restaurant and then ran some errands where he was seen by several people in Lynchenburg from around 12.45 to around 3.10 p.m. 
and he also paid a visit to his sister and had coffee before meeting his parents again and being back home by 5 p.m. He initially stated that he didn't see Peggy at all that day. Now, shortly after Peggy's disappearance, Yulvi was committed for a short stay in a psychiatric facility after exposing himself to a young boy. However, in October of 2002, the investigation into Peggy quickly picked Yulvi up again. Though no trace of Peggy could be found on the clothes that were confiscated from him in 2001, he was arrested and questioned again by the police. He was questioned several times over the course of a day, with each interview lasting hours, eventually leading to a confession. I'm going to say this probably isn't going to stick. I would like to see the full entire recording of all of those. Well, he has the mentality of an 8 or 10 year old. I don't like when any when anyone's completely ruled out via an alibi and then they're brought back in and then they're like... Right, after being questioned, right. Question and question and question, and then all of a sudden they come up with a, within, they have an answer after like hours. Or days. Or days of interrogation. Like, it's not, getting a coerced confession out of someone is easier than people think. Like, I've actually been, so I have been shocked, because I've always thought, if they confessed, like there's no way somebody's going to confess to something they didn't do, but we know now that that happens all the time. I watched like a whole documentary on it where like it's so easy actually to convince someone who's under stress that they like did something or I mean, had something really to do with it. You've really got to be a certain kind of person though cuz I can't imagine any amount of stress making me confess to murder. But hey, but, I don't know. Yeah, I mean I guess you don't know until you're in that position, but then also you got to remember this guy here. Yeah, he, he has the like the brain capacity of like a 8-year-old yeah. like yeah, so Yulvi confessed that he had abused Peggy in his home on May 3 of 2001 and apologized for his actions on the day that she went missing. But she threatened to tell on him and ran away, so he chased her and tried to keep her from screaming by putting his hands over her mouth and nose, suffocating her. So that's the confession story that he came up with or that was supplied to him. So investigators were satisfied with this confession and their efforts over the previous months had charged Yulvi with murder. Mm -hmm. So the trial commenced on the 30th of September, 2003 and ended on the 30th of April, 2004. The questionable tactics used to obtain the confession from a mentally disabled man did not cause issue at trial. Whoa, it didn't cause issue at trial? Nope. Interesting. That's very... Okay. All right. And Yulvi was convicted for the death of Peggy and given a sentence of life. So during his interviews, he did not have legal counsel or a parent, and there's no recording mm-hmm. to prove how mm-hmm. these interviews went. I feel kind of bad. I feel bad, but like also he did like expose himself to a bunch of kids and... Yeah, sexually assault a small and boy. A small boy. Yeah. So, uh, but he also should he be out on the street? Maybe not. But no, but should he be in prison? Maybe also, not. maybe not. So, in addition, an inmate who testified that Yulvi had confessed in prison ended up retracting his statement in 2012, admitting that he lied in court. This admission, coupled with the questionable confession. And interrogation led to the reopening of the case in 2014. And Yulvi's conviction was absolved. So none of that is surprising, right? Like when we look at the way that the interview was done, when we look at the circumstances of the case, I don't think any of us are surprised that his conviction did not hold up. And that's not to say that he didn't do it or didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, but I, I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm honestly surprised that he even got convicted. Honestly. Yeah. Now, after this, a new team of investigators were assigned to investigate Peggy's case. Probably a good idea. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. The hunt for Peggy's remains was renewed, and investigators looked into a tip which said that Peggy might have been buried in an already dug grave of an 80-year-old woman who had died shortly before Peggy vanished. Okay, I'm sorry, but that is, like, the smartest thing you can do with marrying a body is burying it in, like... So a grave that's already dug that's yeah, going to be like, covered over. Yeah. yeah, 100%. Like, that's fucking genius. 
on January 8 of 2014, the grave was disinterred. Which means dug up, especially <laughs> a body. <laughs> yes, good job. But Peggy's remains were not found inside. And in April of 2015, divers went in search of Peggy's satchel, which was reported to have been seen in a nearby park reservoir shortly after she went missing. They but never it re- checked it back then? I'm, you know, I honestly don't know if they checked it back then. I think maybe it was reported to have been spotted there, but they never, like, actually dove into the reservoir to check it. They, like, went and looked maybe and didn't see it. Okay. So th- this is a new team that's going through all the old notes gotcha. and just kind of checking into things, right? Those searchers continued. The hope that she would ever be found started to dwindle. At least they're looking at it again, though. Yeah, because the man they sent to prison for it literally got let out. God. So they're like, well, this would be fuck. The, this would be so hard as her parents to not have closure. You get a little closure. That closure's taken away, and you're still just waiting around for closure. Oh, well, then who knows what her parents thought about this guy being convicted of Rather, her. he was guilty or not. Yeah, you and I feel like that would be even worse to have someone that you're like, mm, maybe they did it. Maybe they didn't do it. Maybe not. Yeah, exactly. Now, on the 2nd of July, 2016. 15 years since Peggy went missing, by the way. 15 years. A mushroom picker that was picking mushrooms in a stretch of forest in Thuringia, around 12 kilometers from Lichtenberg. God, I want to be picking mushrooms in Germany. Are you kidding me? That's found the remains of a young girl. Now, police moved in immediately and removed pieces of the skeleton for DNA testing, and it is quickly determined that these are the remains of Peggy. The remains were found in a location reportedly searched by police with infrared and thermal imaging back in 2001. Now, this is a very heavily wooded area, right? We know that when... Somebody is missing or buried or hidden in a heavily wooded area. Sometimes searching just does not find them. Well, also, maybe when they searched it, maybe her body wasn't there yet. And that could also be. Because, I mean, who knows how long whoever killed her held onto her body. Like, people are weird. Now, Peggy's satchel, parts of her clothing, and her watch were also found alongside her partial oh, remains. so she was probably killed, like, right away. With her, that's what makes me think so with her satchel there. Ugh. Because of the remote location, police were led to believe that whoever had attempted to bury Peggy in the woods would have known the area well. Forensic examination, though, limited in its capacity, was able to determine that Peggy most likely died the day she disappeared and was subsequently moved to the burial site. Her cause of death was thought to be suffocation. But 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. That's a bag of bones. How would you even pinpoint the day 15 years later? Like pinpoint the day she died. Her body is so decomposed. Yeah, there's no... I don't know about that. That would be so hard to determine. It could have been a week. It could have been a month. And suffocation? How, How would you, you know it's Because there's no o- other obvious cause of death. That's usually the what's ruled is suffocation. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So although this discovery was huge, there were little to no clues about who did it still. Right. Now, in October, a fiber that was allegedly found at the scene was found to contain trace DNA of a right-wing extremist, Uwe Bernhardt. Now, we're not really going to go into him or his Nazi shit. We're going to leave that alone for now. But... But, like, when we say extremist, we mean Nazi, like... But. Yeah, he was a mass murderer, not a nice person. But there's no real link between Bernhardt and Peggy that we know of. But his DNA is found at the scene. Okay? Now, it actually turns out that investigators used a ruler at the scene of Peggy's burial site, which had been used at a former scene oh linked to Bernhardt, and had contaminated the scene with the fiber which had fallen off of it, giving yet another false lead in the case. 
Holy shit. But imagine- Somebody dropped the goddamn ball. You're not cleaning the ruler? I know. Well, and imagine this comes out, right? Before they find out how this fiber got there. Like, I imagine this was probably, like, front page news. Like, Nazi terrorist, like, is the murder of this little girl. Like, I can't that even handle so it. That is so bad. A man known as Manuel S., an undertaker and a farmer formerly of Lichtenberg, was revealed to have been an important figure in the case. Manuel had been questioned early on in the investigation and was also mentioned several times by Yulvi as having helped dispose of the body. The reason he was questioned was later revealed to be that the pollen found on Peggy's remains was unlike the pollen where she was found, but instead matched the pollen found on Manuel's farm. Microparticles, said to be from renovations, were also found on the remains. Okay, because I was going to say... If it's just pollen, this pollen's probably all over in the area, but they're saying there was pollen and particles from a remodel. Okay. That was being done on his home. And this was the 17th of May, 2001, that he was renovating his home. Okay. Okay. Which gave them another possible link. Because what day did she disappear? So she went missing May 7th of 2001. So... May 17, we know that he was doing a remodel, which meant she could have still been there, Mm -hmm. theoretically. Now, in an attempt to uncover evidence, the police searched Manuel's home, but nothing was found. It's 15 years later. Yeah. Yeah. But people hang on to stuff, too. I know, like people who do kill Or if she was killed there. Treasures. Right. He could keep something. He is then questioned by police in the presence of a psychologist... But his request for a lawyer was frequently shaken off by police. Manuel S. makes a confession. He claims that he was driving through Lichtenberg in his car when he was stopped by Yulvi at a bus stop who had Peggy's lifeless body. Manuel states that Yulvi asked him to dispose of the body for him, but he did try to revive her first before putting the body of Peggy into his car wrapping her in a blanket and driving her to the forest where he buried her and burned her jacket and satchel later at his home. There you go. That's how you know he's lying because her satchel's there with her. Right. He did not burn her satchel. Correct. But he confessed to it. So false confession right there. Also, why the fuck would Yulvi stop him to have him bury a body? Well, not only this, but Manuel retracts his statement immediately. The police let him go and said to the media that he was under no suspicion of the murder. Because you fucking coerced him into another another person into a confession. Stop doing that. Yeah. So, well, there's a psychologist there, too, which is super weird. I don't know. They're ignoring his request for a lawyer, and then they're like... Oh, he confesses to burning it? Like, I don't know. It's weird. This is weird. Not saying that any of these guys don't deserve to be in prison. Not saying that they didn't do it. But, like... Well, and you also have to remember that this case has a lot of media attention, which brings out a lot of false confessions and false leads and things like that. Now, to this day, this case remains unsolved. Which is just so heartbreaking. I can't even handle it. We will post pictures of her too. We wanted to end this with a little bit from an interview done with Susan and Yasmin, which is her mom and sister. It doesn't get any better. Something would always be missing. To accept that, not even after 20 years, there are very often moments where I wish that had never happened that everything would have just been the same, that she's still here, and that we've spent our lives together up until now. I wish she was still here. Nope, that's sad. We are going to click over to our bunker talk to uh, talk about our suspects or what we think of our suspects in this case. Uh, Thank you so much for tuning in. We will probably... 
not have an episode next week. I'm going to be on vacation. We'll see. We're not sure yet, but if you see one, there'll be one. If not, you'll know why. (laughs) If not, just completely ignore it and it'll be fine. Yeah. All right, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you next week. Bye. If this doesn't prove that the cats literally eat your plants for your attention, my Hoya, which is the exact same plant that you have like five different types of upstairs that the mm-hmm. cats eat. Are you talking about your new one that yeah. has like the trailer? Yeah, yeah. yeah, my, yeah. my brand new one that I just yeah. got. For the last three days that I've had it, it's been sitting on my desk, which the cats are on constantly. <laughs> and not one person has taken a bite out of it. Not one person yeah. has bit it. Like, even shown interest in it. Like, they both sniffed it a couple times, but that's it. Nothing else has happened. Yeah, so we've discovered that the cats only eat my plants, and we're pretty sure they just do it to get my attention. Because she, like, reacts. Like, they, they're they like, look, Grandma, you're not giving me attention. I'm going to bite your plant. Look at this. <laughs> because everyone else has plants, and they do not touch them. You know what I think? I think that they know that your plants are going to die. And so they don't need to go after them. You might be so. onto something, but still, we always just kind of thought maybe they can it's... like smell the death on them. They like know oh, they're God. already You're dying. Ridiculous. You're ridiculous. <laughs> I just kind of always maybe thought maybe it's just a type of plant because I have like different types of plants. Well, they do like specific types a little more than others, but they will literally just like walk up and take a bite out of it while looking at me, just for the, like like the, the hell of it, just for fun. <laughs> my cat will run up. Goose, the white one, he's a big douchebag. He'll run up and get ready to go pee in one of her plants if he's really angry. He he did that once when I, like, threw him off the counter. He, like, ran over, jumped up in my plant, and peed in it. I was like, what in the actual fuck are you doing? He'll also pee in, like, laundry bins if he's mad at you. Like, if you do something and he gets mad at you, he'll, like, go really dramatically get ready to go pee in the laundry bin, like, hoping you'll stop him. <laughs> like... There, it's a mess. He's naughty. Yeah, Maddie bought a plant. We went to this, like, um, it's a charm walk. We do it every year. You go from store to store and you collect charms to create, like, a bracelet. And, like, this, real, this like, uh, town that has this really cute, like, downtown area where they have a bunch of antique shops and boutiques. Right, and, yeah. Like, and we've done it. Like we realized that this was the sixth year of doing it because we actually went back. We just collect all the charms and we put them in, like, a jar on our fireplace. And we went back and looked through them, and we found 2016 was, like, the oldest charm. Yeah. Which I was right. I cannot believe I was right. Yeah. So we're we're looking for one of the stores that's on our map. Because you get, like, a map and, like, a check. Like, they sign off on it when they give you your charms and stuff. And, like, different stores. You have to, like, pay to participate. So you, like, the stores will, like, give money to participate to have, like, more foot traffic in their Yeah, and they do, like, fun stuff. Like, they'll take the charms, and they'll put them on, like, little playing cards or business cards or little pouches like they little do all sorts of fun things, stuff like whatever yeah you usually get a discount if you shop while you're in there and we kind of got lost Oop. damn it maverick we have maverick in here he's like bumping on all of the equipment it's sad because this is his favorite thing on the planet is to be in here while we he's record. so disruptive though and, and it's so can't... cold why do you want to be in here it's cold he loves it he literally sits here and drools he'd rather do nothing else besides being here while we record yeah So we got a little lost and we couldn't find one of the stores on our map. And it was not, to be fair, it was not where it showed on the map. We were looking for it. But we ended up wandering into like this church. They had a bunch of plants outside. And so we thought it was like a store kind of. So we like wandered in and it turns out it was like a fundraiser for this little girl who needs a surgery. So we were like, well, now we have to buy plants. We can't just not buy plants. So we ended up. With plants. Yeah, and I ended up getting the exact type of plant that my mom... It's like my mom's favorite type, I swear to God. Like, she has, like, three different ones, three or four different ones upstairs. I wouldn't say Hoyas are my favorite. I do really like Hoyas because... I like variegated Hoyas, I should specify. Okay, yeah. She loves... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I like when they... If you keep them in the sun, or the more they're in the sun, the whiter the leaves turn. Mine's not going to turn white. No. Mine is green. Yours doesn't even variegate. Mine is green as 
Mine is green and purple. Yeah. You well yours yeah, yours isn't a white mm-hmm. variegated, so but yeah, I I like trailing plants. I yeah, like plants so that I. like trail out. But either way, the cats do not eat my plants. And this is the exact same plant that Maverick literally <sighs> eats upstairs on the windowsill to get your attention. It's the same plant. It's like, not it's different. It's different. But they are both Hoyas. If yeah. he was just <laughs> eating the plant to eat the plant, he'd be eating both of them. They're not that di- he doesn't taste the difference between the variegated Hoya and the non-variegated Hoya. <laughs> I do have There's like- no way he tastes the white in the leaves. <laughs> he, like he might. <laughs> it's like a little salt. Uh no, I No, then Goose would be eating because Goose has a salt addiction. Goose is addicted. That cat has a problem. Yeah. So I don't know. I have a couple poisonous plants and they never never touch those it's like they know they know oh this one could I, probably I make have me told sick. my mother that I will never forgive her if her <laughs> one plant that could kill the cats does kill the cats so I have told her this don't eat she, my plant she still keeps the plant don't eat it they've never touched that one my pothos no because they're not even interested in and eating side plants. note they're only interested in fucking with you side note it wouldn't kill them it would probably just give them the shits so relax no that's actually one of the ones that's like Maybe take your cat to the emergency to the vet, vet. Uh, like immediately. I mean, they'd have to eat a lot of it. The snake plant, your other one, is like a that's a throw up barfy shitty one. Yeah, they like won't. That, they that won't eat just that like a though. Sick it's one. too. But your what are your, you doing? Your pothos is like maybe take your animal to the vet like now. Like maybe go. Do you want to try my breakfast time. shake? Sure, it's a healthy one. I'll warn you. It's really gritty. That's the raspberry seeds. And it has flaxseed in it, too. It's a flaxseed. That's what I'm tasting. <laughs> I could taste the raspberry seed, and I was like, that's not it. It's the flax seeds. Mm-hmm. No. Maverick. And it also See, has... also, they don't... The way that the cats fuck with me is that when I'm like, no, don't do that, they look at me like this. Mm-hmm. Like when they're scratching on things. Yeah, so it has... Raspberries, flaxseed, banana, spinach, um, almond butter. <laughs> Not for it. Get your tail out of my face. Uh, lemon. He's so happy he's doing the tail shakes. Hey, buddy. Oh, my gosh. You're so aggressive. Yeah, this is day two of my cleanse. It's not terrible. It could be worse. Yeah, I had the worst headache yesterday, though. I had, still have it a little bit this morning. I think it's the lack of caffeine. Even though I can drink plain green tea, which does have caffeine in it, but it's not enough. My body's like, where's my fifth cup of coffee, you jerk? 